Romans chapter 8 verse number 14 for as many as are led by the Spirit of God they are the sons of God it is vital for a Christian to know what to do the job of a pastor is not a prayer contractor or the pastor is not a traffic light that's not my job my job is not to sit down and just be praying and praying and praying for prayer requests that's not my job my job is not a traffic light to just be telling people go you stop so a pastor will teach you how to receive leadings and guidance there are other things i have taught like i said things like basics of direction the inward witness following the inward witness leadings and perceptions the series one following god's plans for your life all of that has been taught you need to get them they will help you a lot and their plans purposes and pursuits and we're beginning today with leading and perception series two in this series we want to look at some specifics we are some of us you know run out of ourselves you know some pastor met me and asked me what to do to start a ministry i told him well um you need to get a message before you start a ministry you don't start a ministry until you get a message and then he said to me, um, so what do I do? I said, you will need to first of all sit down. Let's train you, let's teach you, let's inform you, let's build you up. Because if you're not built up, you can't build somebody up. If you don't have a message, you can be a messenger. A messenger carries a definite, specific message. There is no messenger that just says, I was sent. What were you sent with? You say, I don't know, they just sent me. No messenger goes like that. So the first thing for ministry is a message. Then the man of God said to me, but I have already built a hall, I have bought equipment, I have bought everything, and we are set to inaugurate the ministry. I said, well, um, you make up your mind whether you want to inaugurate a building or you want to inaugurate a mandate, a message. Because if you don't have a message, that hall is useless. Those equipments you bought were all useless investments. What makes a ministry, even if there's no hall, there are no equipments, is the fact that there is a message. You can gather people by the road, you can gather them under the tree because you have a message. So what makes a ministry is a message, all right? So, and I said to him, it's better to be slower than God than to be faster than him. Many people have the impression that to hear from God has to be spectacular, has to be dramatic, you know, all kinds of things. Just like as children, we used to think that all angels have fed us. We used to think like that, that all angels have feathers and that all angels are white. But as you grow in the study of God's word, you find out that angels really not all have feathers. In fact, most of them don't have feathers, you know. So such information can stay so long in your mind that it can actually deceive you and give you a thinking pattern that is contrary to the word of God. In 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 11, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Next verse. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. This would have been a very good place to have mountain of fire. The thunder of the Lord most high incorporated all of that will have because those are encounters you saw thunder if the guy was not patient the moment he saw thunder and he moved to start a ministry it will have been thunder of jehovah international if he was not patient he just saw fire he will have started mountain of fire international but watch after the earthquake a fire but the lord was not in the fire and after the fire, a still small voice. After the fire, a still small voice. That small voice is so irrelevant. Still small voice. Compared to the thunder, the earthquake, the fire. The still small voice is irrelevant. So it's very likely, like I said, if it was today, that spectacular will have been it for the guy. But because he was patient, he waited to hear a still small voice. Look at another scenario in John chapter 12. But just before we get to John 12, take note of this. If you're making notes, these are things to write down. Number one, so the leading is from God while perception is ours. 
Leading is from God while perception is ours. Leading is from God so we don't pray for God to lead us. If we pray, it is to perceive God's leading. If we pray, it is to perceive what God is leading us to do. We do not pray for God to lead us. Listen, even when you are out of the will of God, God is still leading you. Even when you are out of the will of God, God is still leading you. It's just that you are not perceiving it. He doesn't stop leading you because you are out of his will. He is faithful to his assignment. He will keep leading you whether you are listening or not. He does not fail in his own responsibility to lead. But it's one thing for God to be leading is another thing for you to perceive his leadings. Because the leading of the spirit is our right and privilege in Christ. The leading of the spirit is our right and privilege in Christ. We don't pray for righteousness. We don't pray for grace. We don't pray for the spirit. So we don't pray for leading. We are righteous. We have the grace of God. That's why we are saved. We have the spirit of God. That's why we are born again. We are led by God. That's why we are sons of God. It's our right and privilege in Christ Jesus. So leading is from God while perception is from us. And we're going to see, you know, the great Paul, the great Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 27, Brother Paul said, nobody, he said, nobody will be rescued. There will be shipwreck and all of us will be dead. That's the first thing he said. Then after a while, he now said, everybody will escape except the ship and the luggage. So what happened? The first time, Brother Paul did not perceive accurately. The problem was not, was not with what God was saying. The problem was with his antenna of reception. Some of you have this antenna in your house where you receive signals for BBC, CNN, Kingdom Life Network, DSTV, and all the different television networks. When your antenna is not accurately placed, the pictures will be very hazy. There will be a lot of flies on your screen, for lack of a better description. There will be a lot of flies, and even the audio will be shh. Because not from the TV station, the TV station sent the right signal and in many houses they are watching the right pictures. HD. Only in your house there is noise on your screen. It is not with the TV station, it is with the antenna positioned in your house that you are having that distortion. God is leading whether you are hearing well or not is your antenna it's not god god is leading because that is your right and privilege in christ jesus now so brother paul the great paul didn't get it right the first time so he had to retune his antenna then he now said, oh, we will escape. An angel of the Lord stood by me last night to help me fine-tune my antenna. We will escape. Only the ship and the luggage will be damaged. So, you would have been running around the fire and celebrating fire, 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 follow me, Holy Ghost, fire. You are busy celebrating fire because you didn't know that the fire was not God. 
The earthquake was not God. The thunder was not God. Those were advanced in clearing atmosphere for the voice. Visions are never conclusive. Every vision will need other things. So, never follow a vision 100%. Never follow a vision 100%. That's why the book of Revelation till today is confusing many preachers. Some of them will come out and say, Jesus will come back in two years' time. Because they are doing what they call the 70 weeks of Daniel. All those are visions. And visions carry very little doctrinal value. They are like parables. Where you have a fact, a fiction, and only a small lesson. Visions have very little doctrinal value. That's why the only doctrinal value in the book of Revelation is very little compared to the other epistles. If you observe, when I taught you on the book of Revelation, I only zeroed in on chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. That's all I stayed on because that is actually the doctrinal value in that book. The latest to the seven churches correcting them on doctrinal ground. So you don't follow a vision 100%. And we're going to see that in a few. Look at this scenario in John chapter 12 verse 28. Father, glorify thy name. This is Jesus. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. God is always leading us, whether we receive it or not. Every time we pray, we are fine-tuning our spirits to receive the direction that God is giving us. Prayer is a fine-tuning activity to be able to pick the accurate signal. Prayer is a fine-tuning activity. So never make the mistake of saying you are praying for God to talk to you. Or you are praying for God to tell you what to do. That is sitting in unbelief. Because God has already told you what to do. Whether you receive it or not, it's now you, no more God. He's a responsible father. He does not wait to be told what to do. He knows what to do and he does what he needs to do. He died while we were yet seen us. Whether we will receive it or not didn't matter. The important thing is that he died and made it available as a responsible father. He said, why take your thought for what to wear, what to eat? For after these things will the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you have need of them and he has made them available. Before you call, I will answer. I'm not answering because you called. I answered before you called. Whether you receive or not now is dependent on you. So the calling is not to make me answer. The calling is to receive the answer I already provided. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. Because God does not react, God pro -act. Before the fall of Adam, God already had the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Which means the fall of Adam did not take God by surprise. God already included the redemption of the fall in his predestined plan. John chapter 8 verse 12 tells us something that will bless you. Then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You can't have Christ and be in darkness. Direction is ours in Christ. Light is direction. He that followeth me shall not have any business with darkness. He shall have the light of life. Now look back again. 
to that John 12, 28. Now everybody said me very loud. Let's release it together. Everybody, I have the light of life. I have no business with darkness. Leadings are my rights and privileges in Christ Jesus. I can never be confused. Can I have a power CD? Amen. John 12, 28. Now again, follow the reading. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Look at the next verse now. This is where the lacuna is. The people therefore that stood by and heard it, they heard it, they heard it, they heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Three different hearings of one voice. Perception. Jesus, some, and others. Yet the voice was very clear because they heard it. But Jesus' antenna was very well positioned. And those who were used to John the Baptist were hearing thunder. Because John is thunderous. You brood of vipers. He was a thunderous guy. And those who are used to angelic ministry. Angel Gabriel. Angel Uriah. Angel Michael. Angel what again? You know there are churches they pray calling all kinds of angelic names. So those kind of people said an angel spoke. So the problem was not with the voice. The problem was with their perception. And their perception was informed by what they believe. Their doctrinal persuasion. If your doctrinal persuasion has a room for witches, they will keep pressing you. Because in your perception, you will be receiving witchcraft signals. Even when God is talking, his witches will be hearing. Because you have tuned your signal to trap. So the question is, this thunder and angel spoke when the father spoke to Jesus, I have glorified, I will glorify again. Jesus had what the father said. They also had what the father said. But they heard thunder and angel. Was it the voice or the perception? The perception. Remember the parable of the sower. The sower soweth the word. Jesus will always speak and they will ask what is he speaking about. The word is the same. But the receivers determine what happens when the word is spoken. Some on good ground, some by the wayside, some among thorns, some on stony ground. The same word falling in four different soil. The problem is not with the word, the problem is the soil. The soil doesn't determine the seed. But the soil determines what happens to the seed. So God always leads you. There is no believer, even if he's a new convert to God born again yesterday, that goes into a wrong marriage without knowing it. There is no believer, even if he got born again just yesterday, that goes into a wrong marriage without knowing it. In Christ we know. But whether we perceive what we know is another thing. There is no believer that didn't have a prior premonition about an accident. No believer. No believer. I've shared with you a number of times where 
I perceived danger and I interrupted a trip. Not once, not twice, not thrice, not four times. There's no believer that is in darkness concerning a particular danger ahead of him. None. Oftentimes, if you observe, it is when you are being taught the word that now you will now begin to go like, oh, I actually felt like that. I actually sensed like that. I actually was feeling like that, but I didn't understand. But you can't feign ignorance. So it didn't change the fact that you were not led. It's just the way you perceived that was the issue. Even in ministry. You know, Jesus was teaching about destroy this body and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Bible says it was after he rose from the dead that they understood what he said. Because when he spoke, they were thinking something else. He said, destroy this body. They were looking at the temple of Solomon. Do you understand? It's like when we say you cannot lose salvation. The next thing they say, what if you commit fornication? Can you see? We say you cannot lose salvation. Their mind went to fornication because fornication has been tormenting them. I'm, I'm not joking. Those people that always say, what about fornication? It's because they have a problem. They want to see whether even they can be helped. That is why that's the first thing. They are asking for their problem. What has loss of salvation got to do with fornication? Is salvation fornication? You see old men that should have sense asking questions. You wonder whether they are the children or they are the mothers or the fathers or whatever. Sometimes it can be very annoying. You see an adult who should think, not thinking. In Acts chapter 10 verse 14, Peter had a vision. Peter had a vision and he came out of the vision wondering what he saw. <laughs> he had a vision. He came out of the vision wondering what he saw. What did I see? <laughs> that's how visions are and you are misled when you follow a vision literal you don't follow them literally God will speak precisely but our perception is where the issue is now go back to Romans 8 14 again and for as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God that word led, every time that word is used, is from the Greek word ago, A-G-O. Is to be led away to something. To be led away to something. So that word is to bear on. Oftentimes, like when Jesus was led away to. And there's a distinction when that word is used. The writer of Romans used the same word in Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Watch this. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Leadeth thee to repentance. Leadeth thee. When he says leads men to repentance, I go, I go. Keep that somewhere. It leads men to repentance. So as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Now Romans 2, 4 is not talking about guidance. It's not saying the Spirit of God carries men to repentance. No, it's not talking about guidance. So if he comes back in Romans 8, 14, even though the construction is different in the Greek, the word or source, which is not numbers, it means all those who are led by the Spirit of God. Which means that the led by the Spirit of God refers to salvation, not guidance. Salvation. Led from darkness to light. Salvation. Led out of darkness into his marvelous light. Delivered from the kingdom of darkness, translated 
into the kingdom of his dear son. Let our go, which has to do with salvation, not guidance on your day-to-day -day decision. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, if you look at the pretext, it will be very clear. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and 2, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Look at verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in, 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 in. If your Bible was mine, I will underline in, in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. So the first thing is, he has made you free. When we say you've been made free, what is that? Salvation. Has made me free. That is salvation. Verse 6 now give you specifics. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Salvation. Look at verse 8 and 9. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But look at verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Why? If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's still talking salvation. He started with salvation. The context is salvation talk. Verse 10 and 11. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Next verse. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth where? In you. Now look at verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Talking salvation. Then look at verse 14 now. For as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. He is saying the result of the work of the spirit is sonship the result of the work of the spirit is sonship so the spirit leads us into sonship or the spirit brings us into sonship the spirit brings us into sonship or the spirit leads us into sonship because look at verse 13 for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit regeneration do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Then look at verse 15 now. For you have not received the closure. Received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you have received closure. The spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba Father. It starts with four. For you have not. Which means verse 15 explains verse 14. To be led by the spirit means you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But adoption, sonship, spirit of sonship. So it's talking about receiving. Verse 15 explains verse 14. Now what verse 14 is talking about is salvation. Then verse 16 now. Oh, I love this. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 15, 14, 13 talks about spirit. Spirit, spirit, spirit. Verse 10, verse 9 Verse 6 talks about spirit. 10, 9, 6, 15, 14, 13, spirit. Verse 2, spirit. Same spirit. It is the same spirit he's talking about from verse 2, which is salvation, to verse 6, verse 9, verse 10, verse 13, verse 14, verse 15. Then verse 16 now, this spirit, not a spirit specific, this spirit 
specifying the spirit he's been talking about, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The spirit is saying, I'm talking about what I have been talking about before. Spirit, spirit, spirit. The spirit like I have been talking about. Bearded witness is two words. It's a compound word. Material in the Greek. To testify by speaking. To bear witness. Material. To testify by speaking. The same thing in Acts 1 8. You shall receive power. You shall be witnesses. Material. Same thing in Luke 24 48. And you are witnesses of these things. Witnesses of these things. Material. It means joint witness or same witness. Son material, son S U N material, joint testimony. Paul used that word two times in his letter. Material. Look at Romans two fifteen. Let's explain it further. Which showed the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts. They meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. I love this one. Material give testimony. Son material joint testimony. So he is saying in that verse we read that the law and their conscience is saying the same thing. The law and their conscience is saying the same thing. Let me read it for you again. Romans 2.15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness. So both the law and their conscience is saying the same thing. Joint testimony. Son material. And their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In other words, what is in the law is in their conscience. What is in the law is in their thoughts. You know, years ago they told us that conscience was the voice of the spirit. But conscience is not the voice of the spirit. Conscience is the voice of your mind. Conscience is the voice of your mind. Your thoughts create your conscience. And your thoughts are a function of your knowledge. Your thoughts create your conscience. And your conscience is a function of your knowledge. Your conscience is a product of your knowledge. So because in Nigeria we have given people the knowledge that bribe is wrong so even when they are asking you for the bribe they know that they are doing something wrong but in america they have knowledge that tip is legal and is their right so when they are asking you their conscience is not disturbing them because in their knowledge they know that to ask you for that tip it's right but here they are asking for the tip they are hiding that's why if you are giving police money you cover it as if you shook them because in their conscience they think what they are doing is wrong am i communicating at all so conscience is a product of your thoughts and your thoughts are a product of your knowledge yeah somebody said no my conscience is not letting me my conscience is not especially people that are religious people that were brought up in crk you know what I mean? People that were brought up in CRK. Somebody is negotiating business with you. You are negotiating very hard. You want to get the best deal. Then your conscience starts doing you like this. Yeah, my conscience will not allow me. Okay, okay. Uh, 50,000 is okay. You could have gotten a better deal than 50,000. You could have pushed it a bit harder. But your religious conscience got in the way. But if they are the ones, they will negotiate you to 5,000. And they don't feel bad. They will leave there celebrating. But you will be feeling bad like you cheated 
somebody. It's a negotiation game. Whoever is able to negotiate better gets the better deal. That's why when you go to business, you don't go with church mind. You go to business with a business mind and get the best deal. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here. No, no, no. That's not my subject for today. So your conscience is a product of your knowledge. Only you know some people will even kill and be happy. They are happy. You, you are the one feeling bad. They are not feeling bad. But because in their conscience there is a schooling that has convinced them that killing is not bad. It's conscience. So weak conscience is a product of lack of adequate knowledge. Strong conscience is a product of the right information. Yes, right information. That's why you come to this church and fear has left you complete. Anybody tells you, hey, tell how? <laughs> Open eye for him. Why? You have the right knowledge. They say, witches are gathering. They say, where are they gathering? I want to give them lunch. Where are they gathering? I want to give them lunch. Because for them to gather means they don't have work. Let's give them food. Kill your enemies with goodness. You're not afraid. You sleep, you see something passing like cockroach in your dream. You stand up and carry broom. Blood of Jesus is too expensive. Broom. Broom is good. If they burn you well, pass here. This broom. <laughs> you save your prayer for better things. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. If they hear me, say, I hear you. How be it? There is not in every man. It's a knowledge thing. Somebody says it's a knowledge thing. Let me face what I'm doing. So, your thoughts create your conscience. If you have the knowledge of an idol, you will have the thought or the consciousness of an idol. So, he says, what is in the law is in their conscience. Look at Romans chapter 9 verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That is, what is in the Holy Ghost is what I have in my conscience. What is in the Holy Ghost is what I have in my conscience. So, my conscience... Bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So Romans 8, 16 again. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. So he says the spirit beareth witness with our spirit. What does he mean beareth witness? That is what is in the spirit is in our spirit. So there'll be no difference in the spirit and in our spirit. If I'm going to use today's language to write that verse 16 of Romans, I will say what we have received, the spirit of sonship is our spirit. What we have received, the spirit of sonship is our spirit. What we have received. That since it is the spirit of adoption, that is the spirit of sons, is our spirit. It's not two spirits. The spirit of sons is our spirit. It's not two spirits. Son material. The word there, son material, is an active word. Just like Romans 9, 1, Romans 2, 15 is an active word. So there's an active witness of our spirits of who we are. An active witness. Our spirit is actively witnessing to who we are. That is, in the spirit of every believer is the active witness of who he is. In the spirit of every believer 
is an active witness of who he is. That is, in the spirit of every believer is the fact, the evidence, the testimony of who he is. In the spirit of every believer is the fact, the evidence, the testimony of who he is. So, son material is active. Like we use the word thoughts, conscience, they are active things. And this is where we get the term inward witness. Inward witness. That is an active thing. It's not referring to the past tense of salvation, but the present tense. The present tense of salvation. If anybody doesn't have that active witness of the spirit, he is not born again. Somebody said to me, Dr. Damina, am I born again? I said, no, sir. If you're born again, you won't go about asking people. <laughs> if you're born again, you won't be asking people, am I born again? No, sir, you're not. If you're born again, you won't go about asking people. You will know it. There will be that active witness in your spirit. Which means his spirit is our spirit. His spirit is our spirit. So, let me ask you now. The active witness is where? Huh? In our spirit. So, the inward witness is our spirit. The inward witness is our spirit. See, the proof of our sonship is not in the Holy Ghost in that context. The proof of our sonship is in our spirit. The proof that my father, Damina, is my father, is not in his genes. The proof that Damina is my father is in my own genes. The proof that somebody is my father is not his genes. It will be my own genes. If my genes don't agree with his genes, he's not my father. It is my genes that will prove that this is my father. It's called DNA test. So the proof that God is my father is not in the Holy Ghost in that context. It's in my spirit. This is where the proof is that God fathers me. I have his spirit, his DNA. If God and I walk into a lab for DNA test, our DNA is the same. Of his own will begat he us. Begat. It's like literally going to the labor ward and pushing out a baby. Begat he us. Then John will put it like this. Whatsoever is born of God. DNA. Being born again, not of corruptible sperma, but of incorruptible sperma by the word of God. So the word of God, which is God, gave birth to sons. So those sons and God have the same DNA. Is it getting clear? You are born of God. And you have his spirit. You have his DNA as the proof of your sonship. Glory to God. I say glory to God. So our spirit is what shows that his spirit is ours. So question, what is in our spirit? That is the evidence of what we are. That's why you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. For God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a summer, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Let me run through them, for example. The gifts of the spirit, that term is not a term used by Brother Paul. Gifts of the spirit is not a term used by Brother Paul. 
Because if Paul uses the term gift of the spirit, it is contradictory to his revelation. Look at Hebrews. Is the writer of Hebrews. Is Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. Next verse. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast. And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Next verse. God also bearing them witness. Both with signs and wonders. And with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. According to his own will. Gifts of the Holy Ghost. That word gifts of the Holy Ghost there is not charisma. Where you have charisma, that is the faculty. It is the word merismos, merismos, which is dividing, talking about ministries. Because charisma is in, charisma is not of, charisma is in our spirits, charisma is not in God, charisma is in the spirit of the born again man. So just like the witness is in our spirit, the charisma is in our spirit. So we have the gifts. Look at 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4. It says, now there are diversities of gifts. But the same spirit, the same, somebody said the same, the same, diaresis, the same. Remember we said, son material is active, joint witness is active. So, where is the witness of our sonship? Huh? In our spirit. Where are the gifts of the Spirit? So we can say that the gifts are part and parcel of our sonship. It's part of you. You don't look for gifts. The day you receive the Holy Ghost, all came. That is in our spirit, we have the witness. So in our spirit, we have the gifts. So that leads us to where we are going. How does our spirit function in the earth? That's where we're going. How does our spirit function in the earth? Because if guidance is in my spirit, the witness is in my spirit. So how does my spirit function in the earth? Brother Paul will help us. First Corinthians chapter 12 verse 4. Please pay attention. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but what? The same. Somebody said the same spirit. Now, the same spirit. D, 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 same. T-H-E. The same spirit, which is particular. Particular. The same spirit. The same spirit. How be it in the spirit? He speaketh mysteries. The same spirit. In the spirit. The same spirit. In the spirit. 14.2. Can we all read together like a mask for everybody? For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. For no man understandeth. How be it in the spirit? He speaketh what? Mysteries. What is a mystery? Is the word mysterion. A mysterion is undisclosed information. Undisclosed information. So let me ask all of you a question. 
Does a mystery mean undisclosed wisdom? Don't be political with me. <laughs> When a child of God is looking for what to do about something, what is he deficient in? When a child of God is looking for what to do about a situation, what is he looking for? Wisdom or an information. He's in need of an information or he's deficient in wisdom. So because he's deficient in wisdom, it is affecting his pace in making a decision. Because he's deficient in an information, it is affecting him making a choice or deciding what to do about a situation. So... Why is he looking for that information? Because he doesn't know. So at the time he doesn't know the information, what is the information to him? A mystery. So does a mystery means undisclosed wisdom? Exactly. So when you speak in tongues, what do you speak? Huh? What do you speak? So you are speaking undisclosed information. But in that mystery that you are speaking, the information, the wisdom you need, is it contained in that mystery? The only thing is that it is not disclosed. So armed in your mouth, is the wisdom you need for life but in an undisclosed manner so every time you go you just said a solution to that business deal but it has not been disclosed so once you disclose it you're already successful so armed with the coming of the spirit is everything you need to reign in life. What did we just say? Undisclosed wisdom. He that speaketh, speaketh not to men but unto God. How be it? In the spirit. 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 The word the spirit shouldn't confuse you. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in tongue, my spirit prayeth. But my understanding is unfruitful. Next verse. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit. The spirit. Previous verse, my spirit. Next verse, the spirit. I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. So my spirit is the spirit. The spirit is my spirit. So now go back to 1 Corinthians 14.2. Let's apply that. 1 Corinthians 14.2. Can we read together everybody? For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understanding it. How be it in my spirit. In my spirit, which is their spirit, I speak mysteries. My spirit is their spirit. Their spirit is my spirit. My spirit is their spirit that speak at wisdom. The wisdom is not coming from somewhere. The wisdom is already in me. So is the spirit my spirit? Huh? Huh? So where is the gift of tongues? Say it loud. Let me hear you louder. <laughs> where is the gift of tongues? So when you egamano, where is it coming out from? And your spirit is? So when I speak in tongues, is it my mouth that is active or my spirit? 
So if I speak with tongues, what am I making known? What am I making known? You want to marry and you don't know who to marry out of five men. And you do, In that tongue, the man to marry, you have said it. And let him that pray in tongues, pray that he may in. Somebody stand on your feet, say, I have the solution to life questions, life situations in my hands by my spirit, which is the spirit. I cannot go under. I can only go over. You didn't shout that amen like thunder. He that speaketh in tongue, speaketh not to men. The moment you start speaking in tongue, you have left the level of men. The moment you start speaking in tongues, you have left Jeff Bezos. You have left Elon Musk. You have left Bill Gates. Their level is elementary. You have entered the realm of the creator of the universe. You are no more speaking to mortals. You are speaking to the immortal. Speak not to men, mortals, but unto God, immortal, and albeit in the immortal realm. He is churning out solution, wisdom, information that is superior to mortal men. Lift your hands up for two seconds, three seconds, five, ten seconds. Let's just speak solutions. Let's speak solutions. Open your mouth and speak mysteries. Zia Katole, Lebora, Nakete, Lenema, Nakata, Nagangle, Nemangre, Nagago, Lenema, Kataya, Egebo, Shekele, Agara, Teba, Babra, Gede, Gegeske, Bayana. I'm not hearing you, I'm not hearing you, I'm not hearing you. Egebo, Shekele, Rabas. Speak solutions. Solution to that health situation. Solution to that office. Solution to that job. Solution to that marriage. Solution to that home. Solution to that connection. Go ahead. Le grand abo sekele daba. Babra gadege jekele na agabarake agalene ma agebazoke agalene bore kasaka ange shokola ageba sobera rakote agaba lekora makele nakosa lekeda lobera keteba legora lekeba shokoba reketa marako legebo sakai yeah. Solution, direction, answers to questions, speak mysteries. Praise you, Father. Glory to the Lamb of God. Sekola Dabash. Lebranda Gagasakaya. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this building, online, on television, radio audience, all our campuses. Revelation knowledge grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. Solutions, directions, insight, information, wisdom, strategy, the plan, the plan, the plan, the work plan for your life. The work plan for your life. Zezo Kotonaka. The work plan for your meaningful life. The work plan for your fulfilling life. And in the name of Jesus, you receive right now. 
Thank you, Father. Sickness dissolved. Confusion dissolved. Doubt dissolved. The complications of life dissolved. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. Thank you for the blessing. We rise bigger and taller in understanding to function in that realm where you function. To bring down heaven's solutions to solve earthly problems. And we give you praise for victory on every side. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a victory. Amen. Can we celebrate a victory celebration?